Everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Neil Donald Walsh, and he is talking about his newest book, The God Solution. And so I I want to read a quote in here. Humanity's biggest dilemma relating to God is not whether people think there is or is not a God, but what those who think there but what those who think there is a God hold as their belief about God. So that is the topic of the show today. So welcome, Neil. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And thank you for the opportunity to share this uh, time with you. So tell me a little bit about how, what, what, what prompted you to write this book? Well, you know, uh, honestly, the, um, the um, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, or what some people believe is a pandemic. I realize there's a lot of politics around that. Some people think it's totally fake. It's not even happening. Some people think, well, it is happening, but it's not as much as they say it is. Some people say it's a real uh, pandemic. But without, without getting into the politics, uh, there certainly is a global situation. And, and it has caused some uh, economic uh, collapse, some economic despair around the world as well and created other fallout effects also. And so, you know, when when I saw the whole world just trying to figure out a way to navigate this experience, I realized, you know, we have a we have a dilemma around this idea of God. We're not quite sure, you know, wh wh where God fits into all of this. Uh, um, uh, I was reading online a couple of months ago that uh, surveys have been taken, sociological surveys have been taken through the years, and even most recently in the past five or eight years, in every um, culture on the planet, asking the question, do you believe in a higher power? And I didn't realize, but eight out of 10 people, that's 80% of us, believe in some sort of higher power. We may not agree on the fine print, but we all agree there's something larger going on than just us. With that background, I began to wonder, you know, if there is a God, if there is a higher power of some sort, excuse me, <coughs> I'm sorry, if there is a higher power of some sort, what's the problem here? I mean, why is the earth such a mess? Why are we continuing to be in such dilemmas? Not just the God dilemma, but the human dilemma. One issue, one crisis after the other, really through the centuries. Where is God in all of this? And if there really is a God, why doesn't God stop it? Why doesn't God, you know, turn things around for us or stop us from getting into these difficulties to begin with? So I began to think we have a real God dilemma here because not only do 80% of us believe in God, the statistics tell us that there are 4,300 religions on the face of the earth. Wow. Yeah, I didn't make that number up. That's an actual count. <laughs> wow. 4,300 religions on the face of the earth. So with all of that belief in God, what good is it doing us? What's the point of having a God if life is going to fall out the way it's falling out? That's what I call the God dilemma. Mm -hmm. So I began looking very seriously at that and I started just writing some thoughts down, which honestly wound up turning into a book. Hmm. which offered me what I'm calling in the book, the God solution, excuse hmm. me. And the God solution offers us an answer to the question, where is God in all of this? And why does God not just jump in and turn things around? If God cares for us and, and is concerned about the human species, and the answer that I came up with was, it's not God's job to fix things. It's not God's job to prevent things. It's not God's job to change the human uh, experience. Uh, it's God's desire and God's great joy to empower us to do so. So God's job is not to create a God didn't intend, as I understand it, to create uh, some kind of a fiefdom, some kind of a kingdom in which we do exactly as we're told. And if we do as we're told, you know, God makes sure that we're treated well and good things happen to us. Uh, 
that isn't that that wasn't the intention. The intention, as I understand it, was for God to create a species of sentient beings. By the way, not just here, but on planets all over the cosmos. This isn't the only place where mm. intelligent life exists in the cosmos. But it was God's intention, in my understanding, to create sentient beings who could then be empowered to create and produce their own experience. So rather than us asking God, why are you allowing these things to happen? And why aren't you stopping these things from happening? In a sense, one could say God might be asking us the same question. Why are we allowing these things to happen? And why don't we put a stop to these things? Not just, you know, it, um, things like disease or viruses, but wars and violence and anger and the terrorism that's been visited upon the planet, starvation and uh, abject poverty, not just a little poverty, but abject poverty, where we see 625 children dying of starvation every week. I'm sorry, I meant to say every day. I'm sorry, I meant to say every hour. Wow. Of course, I knew the statistic. I was using that as a device to make it very clear. We're talking about 625 children dying of starvation on this planet every single hour. Wow. And so God is perhaps asking us, why are you allowing that? When you have the, absolutely the perfect capability to stop it, you could stop it in the next hour if you chose to. But clearly you're not making those kinds of choices. So what kind of a civilization are you trying to create? And I am simply empowering you to create whatever you wish to create, mm -hmm. because every act is an act of self-definition. But now here is the problem. As I see it, we are modeling our human behavior based on our understanding of how God behaves. Oh. That is, we assume that God is a violent, angry, and vindictive deity. We assume, because most of our 4,300 religions teach us, some version of the following statement. God has things that God needs, things that God hopes for or asks for, or actually demands that God commands certain things. And if we don't give what God commands to God, we will in fact be judged and condemned and punished. Therefore, we have decided that, well, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for us. So we've based our own behaviors on that particular model. And we therefore judge, condemn, and punish each other and punish others. We have hierarchies that we have created on our planet, even as some religions claim that there are hierarchies that God creates in God's universe. I mean, if you don't belong to a particular religion, so some of the stories go, if you don't belong to a particular religion, you're not going to heaven. It, it doesn't matter how kind you are, how compassionate you are, how gentle and caring and patient you are, how understanding and forgiving you are. None of that matters if you don't belong to this particular religion. You are, you're going to hell. You're going to be sent to hell for simply choosing the wrong way to believe in God. Not even for not believing in God. You believe in God, but simply the wrong way. You didn't choose the right brand. You didn't choose the right religion. So you can tell, tell me all about how you are devoted to God, but you're not in the right religious group. And so God's kicking you out and sending you down to hell. That's the way we treat each other because it's our understanding of the way God treats us. Mm. So what I call the God solution is a brand new way to define God. Mm -hmm. I am in this book daring humanity to redefine God, to come up with a new definition because it's my understanding that we simply don't have all the information in. It's not that religions are wrong. You know, the 4,300 religions on the earth are not totally, completely, and absolutely wrong. If they didn't have some wisdom, and I mean good wisdom to share with us, they wouldn't have lasted this long. It's just that they don't have all the information. 
we don't have all the information in yet. So we're like, to use an analogy, we're like children who have learned how to add and subtract. And we think that's all there is to mathematics. But you know, there's multiplication and long division and algebra and geometry and trigonometry and higher math. There's much more to mathematics than simply adding and subtracting. But if we think that that's all there is in our arrogance, we will assume that all the problems can be solved by simply adding and subtracting. So this is the way religions, in my view, have uh, found themselves to be in that situation. That is, they don't have all the data. So I have a question to, that I've placed before humanity. And the question is this, is it possible, just possible, that there's something we don't fully understand here, the understanding of which would change everything? Is it possible there's something we don't fully understand about God, about life, and for that matter, about each other and ourselves? And of course, in my view, the answer is yes. We're a very young, immature, primitive species. And we haven't even begun to grasp the fullness of what there is to know about what we call the higher power. So I'm offering a new definition. Not only do I dare people, dare humanity to come up with a new definition, I've also offered a new definition. And that new definition is a two word definition of God. What if God was simply defined as pure love? Now, you know, when I say this in front of a lecture audience, audiences say, oh, Neil, 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 nothing new there, nothing new there. Everybody agrees that God is love. We not, may not agree on some of the other ideas, but there's no one who would disagree that God is love. Of course God is love. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't say that God is love. I said that God is pure love. That's a particular brand of mm -hmm. love. So then the audience says, well, well, what's the difference? The difference, I tell them, is that pure love needs nothing, requires nothing, demands nothing, commands nothing in return for the giving of it. That pure love is an energetic expression that finds its reward in the expression itself. And there's nothing else needed in return. Mm. And so what if we believed in a God who says, you know what? I actually, hard as this might be for you to believe, I am the supreme being that needs nothing. I don't even need your worship. I certainly don't need you to worship me in a particular and certain way on a certain day of the week, wearing certain kinds of clothes or performing certain kinds of rituals. You made that all up. Mm. I don't need anything from you. But what I would desire is that you would use the power that I have given you to produce and generate the outcomes and the life of which you are capable of producing. You could really have heaven on earth if you simply used the energetic power that I have given you. We call it metaphysics. You're not even using the metaphysical power that I've put in your hands, the power to create and to manifest your own reality. Mm. And so the God solution proposes that we can begin to use the higher power in a way which allow us would allow us to change life on earth the way it is now and, and alter the trajectory in which we are headed. Mm. And it also gives one last thing. The last half of the book is an actual description of how to use metaphysics. It's a it's almost like a training manual. The last half of the book shows how we could use metaphysics, how we can apply that power in everyday life to manifest as a collective known as humanity, the life of our dreams and of our desires. We don't have to live this way anymore. We don't have to we don't have to have leaders of nations acting like four-year-olds. Our missiles are bigger than your missiles. You know, really? Nor do we have to have religious leaders telling us things like the Pope said 
just the other day, the Catholic Church just announced that it cannot bless same-sex marriages because in the words of the Catholic Church's announcement, God cannot bless sin. Mm -hmm. So we are told that if you're not a Christian, we are told by Christians, of course, that if you're not a Christian, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter how nice a person you are. Get this, you're going to hell because you're not a Christian. And, you know, you might think that's kind of a tough rule, but as God would say, sorry, dems the rules. <laughs> okay, so the, in your book, you talk about, um, and you just mentioned using the power that is given to us. And so I wanted to take, um, and you actually have five different steps. So, um, Presume that the higher power exists. Describe the higher, higher power as energy that can be physically felt. Call that feeling pure love and make a switch. Replace the thought with an emotion as your item in your spiritual. So there's these steps. So I, I want to go to what I'm feeling right now is in like the atmosphere. There's a huge amount of impatience um, I don't want to wear my mask. I'm sick of wearing this mask. Um, uh, there's a lot of intolerance. This person is to blame. You know, there's all the, this kind of intolerant behavior and or um, judgment, like you were saying. So you well, see... Alienation. We, are, we are seeing alienation at a higher level between people, between uh, generations, between economic levels, between sexual orientations, even between the genders, between men and women, between conservatives and liberals. All we're seeing all up and down the line is alienation, alienation, alienation. They're wrong. We're right. They're wrong. We're right. Mm -hmm. So how, what... would I, how would I apply this? this power that I have given to me and using this, these suggested five steps to turn it around. I mean, let's just take a real thing that's happening now. And how could I, as a human being, listen to, I, I feel the alienation. I'm experiencing the alienation around me, inside me. How would I take this, this five step process and use it? Well, you would, you would take the five steps. Okay, so presume the higher power exists. You would, so that first step is you would presume, in fact, there is a higher power, and I'm embracing that in my life as a functioning reality, not just a concept, not just a theory, not just a thought that somebody had. I'm embracing that as my new, if it, if it is new, my functioning reality. Yeah, there join the eighty percent. <laughs> join the eighty yeah. percent. There yeah, join, is no yeah, God. What a, what a great title! Join the eighty percent. <laughs> great book title there. So I'm joining the 80% and I'm going to embrace as a functioning reality, the notion that there is a higher power. That's step number one. Okay. So step number two, describe the higher power as an energy that can be physically felt. Yes, so I'm going to so I'm going to take that step. and I'm going to say, okay, I'm not going to think of the higher power as this being in the sky in most of the 4,300 religions, this being has a penis. Right. It has to be male. It, it can't be female right. because the higher power <clears throat> wouldn't be female. Of course. Right. Of course not. <clears throat> it has to be male. It's long white hair and a beard and looking... Sort of like you. Like, kind of like yeah. you. you. You look like God. <laughs> kind of like me. Yeah, I, I, a little bit like that. Okay. So, so we, would have to, we would have to change our mind about who and what God is. We would say... What if God was a self-aware, self-conscious energy that, that could take any form it wished, a male form indeed, a female form, or could take the form of all the physical objects in the universe? What if, that, what if in fact, the universe itself was a manifestation of the energy that we call divinity? and? What if everything in the universe was an individuation of that energetic projection? 
Now that's a daring thought because it suggests that not only is everything in the universe, all the planets, all the stars, all the galaxies, you know, all the satellites that are out there uh, would, would be energetic individuations of God, but it also suggests that, dare I suggest it, we are. That because we're part of the physical universe, we are in fact individuations of that energetic projection that we call divinity. Mm. That is, that you are divine and I am divine, and that we are divinity individualized. Mm. And that's step two, is that we would embrace that notion. You know what? You know what, guys? There's more going on here than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. So I am God, you are God. Actually, his pen is God. <laughs> well, individuations of God. You know, right. when, I, when I say I am God, people say, oh, wow, wow, what an arrogant statement. No, 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 no. I'm not the totality of God. So I, I resist the temptation to say I am God. But I would say this, I am to God as a wave is to the ocean. That a wave arises from the ocean. It's not something other than the ocean. It's not the ocean itself, but it is an individuational arising, a separate expression, another expression of the ocean without ever completely separating from the ocean itself. It's a magnificent, glorious expression. But when that expression is complete, the wave recedes back into the ocean and becomes one with the ocean once again. In fact, it was never not one with the ocean. It was simply an arising of the ocean that we call a wave. Mm. That is my relationship, as I understand it, with the divine. I am an arising of, an expression of, an individuation of the totality that we sometimes call God. Mm. So I'm not God in the sense of being the totality of God, but I am an individuation of divinity as you are and as is everything and everyone else individuating divinity in different and various forms. Mm -hmm. Now, the solution to the challenges facing humanity that makes step two so powerful is to allow ourselves to experience that reality mm -hmm. that every other human being and every other sentient being in the cosmos is a demonstration and an individuation of divinity that takes us to step three. Decide to call that feeling pure love. So the step two is describe the higher power as an energy that can physically be felt. So I assume it's like feeling the pure love. Yes. And if I, if I that, were that a wave we, that, in that, yeah. Yeah, that we, that we don't think of God anymore as simply some amorphous being and you know, a, a huge, a larger than life human, you know, as we talked earlier with a beard and so forth and all that wearing a big long robe and sitting on a, on a throne somewhere, but that God is in fact a self-conscious, self-aware, energetic projection. And then we call that energetic projection pure love. It's an energy that can be felt. And anyone who's ever had a, uh, or experienced a direct connection with God, and many people have, by the way, sometimes in prayer, sometimes in meditation, sometimes in a moment of solitude or, or a moment of, of begging God for an answer, Many people have, have experienced what they call the presence of God in their life. Mm -hmm. Almost everyone would describe it as pure love. I felt that I was enveloped by pure love, a feeling of bliss, which takes us to step number four. Make an important switch, replace the thought with emotion as the item as the item in your spiritual metaphysical toolbox in which you will now put, pay the most attention and of which you will make the most of you. So let's say alienation is the, I'm so, I'm so stuck here, I'm so lonely, I'm stuck here and I can't wear a mask, I'm, you know, whatever, some alienation kind of thought. How do I translate that to an emotion? And, well, it, yeah. it, 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 the, the problem is that we've been hearing for years, change your mind, change your life, change your thinking, change your life. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of books have been written about how you can, if you can just think in a certain way, 
you can manifest the reality you wish to manifest. And what we're suggesting in the God solution is that it's not simply about thinking, but in fact, it's about substituting what you're thinking with feeling. It's emotion, energy in motion, E equals motion. It's energy in motion that creates the power where the power is found to manifest our individual and our collective reality. So our opportunity, if we want to change the alienation we're experiencing on the planet, is to change the emotion that creates alienation, is to, is to have a different emotion, the opposite emotion from alienation, which would be unity, unity. Yeah. or oneness. And if we can begin to experience that emotion, and then there's an even more daring suggestion in the God solution. It is suggested that we not only move into our own highest emotion with regard to anything that's arising in life, but in fact, substitute what we would understand and imagine to be God's emotion. What if we decided to project into the universe the emotion that we understand and would expect God to feel in the same circumstance. Would God feel alienated because there's a thought about wearing a mask mm -hmm. or losing our identity or our freedom? Would God feel alienated or would God feel, wait a minute, maybe there's a way by discussing it and hearing all points of view to come to some new and larger way to embrace the present circumstance where alienation does not have to be part of the experience. Is it possible, I would, I would ask, I, Neil, would ask, is it possible for us to live in a world where some people think, you know, wearing a mask is a good idea. I have no problem with it. I think it's a very good idea. And other people think, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's needed. I don't think it's necessary. Can we find a way for opposites to get along? Or must we be alienated simply because we're different? Mm -hmm. And that's the problem we've had in these most recent days and times. We've allowed our differences to produce divisions. Mm -hmm. But differences don't have to produce divisions. And, and that's what we have an opportunity to change if we wish to do so. We can find a way, you know, this is not a brand new idea. It's simply one that we have yet not been able to, in the 21st century, find a way to resolve. You know what? what's interesting? We consider ourselves an advanced species, an advanced civilization, yet we can't even learn to get along. We can't even get along with people who hold points of view that are different from our own. We actually, in some cases, kill each other over the differences in our points of view. What kind of a civilization would do that except the most primitive species you could imagine? So the God solution is to step into this new way of living, which is the creation of a new global ethic based on pure love. Right, so what would a loving, not a judgmental, condemning, punishing, hierarchical God do, which is how we define God, but if we redefine God as pure love, what would pure love do in this particular situation where there's- Pure love, pure love would do what I just suggested. Yeah, no, I know go. that's, yeah, that's, that's basically what step four is. And step five is to decide to put into action the specific feeling that God has defined as, not just by creating or experiencing emotion, which you, which, with which you respond to in any given moment, but also by holding, honing your ability to create future moments. So it's not about just, the two of us hypothesizing what God would do. It's actually, I assume this means like acting. So living, the next living time, into it. Yeah. By, by living into it. If God were sitting at the table with us and one of us, to use the example we've been using, 
was wearing a mask and saying, I'm perfectly okay with this. This is not a problem for me. I don't feel that my freedom has been taken from me. And the other person across the table was saying, my freedom has been taken from me. I don't want to wear a mask. We shouldn't have to wear a mask. It's not necessary. I shouldn't be forced to. What would God do if he was the third person sitting at that table? Would he say, you're right, or you're right, or you're both wrong, or you know, what, what in fact do we think that God would do? Yeah. And what would pure love do? Yeah. And there's an answer there. It's not an irresolvable problem because the problem is not about wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. The problem is not about being conservative or being liberal. The problem is not about being gay or being straight. The problem is not about any of that stuff. The problem is how can we find a way to love each other even though we have differences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, How, and yeah. In, in the year 2021, can we find a way to tolerate our differences? You would think so yeah. for a species that imagines itself to be advanced. Yeah, I guess what I, I guess it all comes back to where is God in all of this? It's to maybe help us find unity, right? To see how bad what it, what it, it comes gets. back. What it comes back to for me is not where is God in all of us, mm -hmm. but why is the God that is in all of us not being allowed by us mm. to come forward? Mm. Why are we not calling that forth and allowing ourselves to interact with each other in a way that demonstrates divinity, whether, rather than denigrates divinity. Mm -hmm. See, we, you know, when did we start calling each other names? When did world leaders, I don't mean you know, somebody at the, on the street corner or somebody in a, you know, in a pool hall or in a bar and grill, I'm talking about world leaders start calling each other names, mm -hmm. start bullying each other and start thinking that this is what leadership is all about. You don't agree with you? I'll call you a nasty name. And I'll see if how many others uh, can I, I can get to agree with me. When did divide and conquer become the way to lead? Mm. When did that become fashionable? When did that become all right? When did we start cheering for the person who could call the other person the meanest name? and denigrate their very personality simply because they hold a point of view different from us. Yeah. Uh, and we uh, decide to call that leadership. And I think it's actually, it goes before Trump because I think a lot of people- I didn't, would, I didn't say Trump. No, no, you, I know. You, I think you. a lot, no, I think a lot of people would jump into what you're saying and say it was Trump, but it, it goes, be, it's way before that, right? Well, I, I didn't mean, even mention Trump. I, I know, I, I did. For, for the record, I did. Let's get real I did. clear. <laughs> I, I was I not did. talking about Donald Trump. No, but I think that a lot of people in liberal Seattle would go in that direction. And I would argue that this is just this division and lack of leadership has been lasting for a very long period of time. That's my point precisely. Yeah. Not about Trump at all. We've been doing this for centuries. I know we have. That's exactly my point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how wonderful that you've written this book and that you took this time in COVID to explore such an important question. Um, we've been talking to Neil Donald Walsh, and he's going to be coming to East West Bookshop and actually um, presenting. He's going to be offering a four-hour workshop to kind of put some of these ideas to test um, in the workshop. Um, and his book, The God Solution. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here with you. I appreciate it very much.